her visa came through, so she'll be here very soon. Hello, Maya. She's doing A2 chemistry. Not. Right. Um, there you go. Okay, let me take water out of the way of laptops. <laughs> it's always I am fair. I need to just put you back onto the PDF thread. Okay. So that you've got your overall thing to move around and then put your Actually, you know what? Great, you could control that side of things. I can. You could control the computer because. Are you looking here? Uh, no. Let, let, so why, why don't you scan through that? Okay. And you know, just do the whole paper scan. Yeah. And then you can move around the whole box right. and get the attention. So there we go. Um, let's go to the start. So this first page that was pretty mm -hmm. straightforward. Yep. Pretty easy. That this part, that was the one that I found probably the hardest question. Could be just getting in back into it, but also like also it's a bit of a different layout, as I said, to the newer papers. And there I had to like check with the mark scheme to make sure that I was giving them what they wanted. Okay. And with one of the parts I got a bit confused then. So that that's probably something that we should okay. go through. All right. then, and don't just ask. Uh, yes. In the um, year that you had last year, yeah. uh, how much I mean, a real practical work did you do? Because you know, the facilities um, there were as strong as they yes. might be in other schools. So. We went, we didn't do much to mm -hmm. be honest. We went to the lab, I think, twice for chemistry. Okay. All right. That's it. But yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, do you know what you did? It? We did <laughs> titration. Okay, so you did a couple of titrations. Yeah, we did. Okay, all right. So that means we're not talking completely, um, kind of theoretically. You know, you've done some practical titrations. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, yeah. Good. Yeah. So then um, that was okay. Part D was pretty easy. Then second question, that first part's fine. It's just a table. Mm -hmm. um, plotting my plot, plot, plotting a graph. Plotting, plotting a graph. Plotting, plotting a, line, a graph. Plot, yeah. Plotting a graph. Yes. Yeah. That was okay too. Yeah. And then um, that was also pretty straightforward, but mm -hmm. we might want to go over it if, okay. like, there are some things I know that when I was first setting out to do these papers, why the um, anomalous points are anomalous, like sometimes that's something, but yeah, that's quite subtle. Quite, yeah. yeah, but it was it wasn't too bad. Okay. So mainly it's just that 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 section for me, that this one that okay. I found quite right. probably the hardest part. Yeah. yeah. Is that because um, Sorry. you had uh, conceptual difficulties with the fact that you had to do uh, one equation and then you had to do a titration and work back to the first equation? Or was it the difficulty of writing it all out in that long narrative part there? Um, that narrative part is okay. Well, I still use bullet points. Okay. I don't actually write a paragraph. Mm -hmm. It was more... Um, I'm not entirely sure. I'm used to working with two equations in hydrogen yeah. and going back yeah. and yeah. comparing the number of moles right. and things like that. I think it was more just, it could just be that I'm rusty, but right. I got mixed up when I got to this fourth part. So in terms of, and the mark scheme wasn't that helpful in terms of how I should make the solid sodium, how I should prepare it okay. and right. how much detail I need to go in there. Because yeah. with the other papers, they do give it quite detailed in terms of like you should write this and this and this, right. and in this mark scheme it was quite there, so I wasn't entirely sure. All right, and when you did the titrations uh, last year, did you have to prepare these standard solutions? No, so we so did the titration, the, yeah. but you did, you, you did say the solution is going to be red, you've actually got to go and make that first. We did, we did make it in terms of like we dilute, we reported, we didn't actually from a solid, we never okay. had to make right. anything, okay. but uh, yes. All right, okay, so tell me what you think. So what I thought, actually, is before we get into the paper, mm -hmm. I'm just going to go over some vocabulary with you. Okay. So that when we come to the paper, uh, even if we're not writing things down, mm -hmm. when I'm saying particular words or you're asking questions, we've got yep. a common vocabulary. Okay, good. Um, and that will help us actually write good answers because we've got the vocabulary in place. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Because uh, we've got an hour and a half, and I think we need to concentrate on that hotspot there. Mm -hmm. And we could get through that probably in 
let's say 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. So if we did uh, say half an hour per cabinet, mm -hmm. uh, then when we, when we come to discuss the part that's difficult, we're speaking very clearly okay. about um, that part of the paper. That's good. Yeah. yeah. All right, and that's why I asked Tom if I could have a, a space somehow on the right hand side because Great. I need to talk about some stuff and talk about mm -hmm. terms of vocabulary uh, before we uh, start filling in the blanks uh, over here. So let's see my live over here. Okay. All right. Do you want so, me to enlarge it or? Uh, so we're at one hundred twenty-one percent at the moment, aren't we? So. Uh, do you want just the white sheet? Do you want just the white? Uh, the yes, that, that's all, all I just need in okay. almost like a whiteboard at the moment. So. Okay, so if I do this. Is that, oh, sorry. Is that, that, is that okay? Yes, fantastic. Great. Oh, no, that's what I mean. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right. So, uh, where am I? Okay. So, um, because this is all uh, practical work that we're talking about here mm -hmm. in paper five, then uh, the, I don't know, so the 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 no. there we go. So the uh, data that you've got is all going to be. I'll speed up again. It's all inexact, or it has uncertainty about the data. So uh, you might have I don't know twenty five centimeters cube, plus or minus. Some uncertainty. Mm -hmm. we, we don't. We don't exactly know what these numbers are. There's yeah. an uncertainty associated with them, and that uh, uncertainty, okay, it, and this is just the language that we're, we're going to be using, is either related to precision, or it's related to accuracy. And I, I wonder, in the work you've done so far, did, how you distinguish between Precision, something a, a piece of data that is precise, mm -hmm. and a piece of data that is accurate. Joe, uh, I suppose I should still be because that's oh, a kind okay. of broadcasting. So, okay, so um, the um, precision is how close uh, repeats are together. Mm -hmm. All right. Whereas, I'm, you have to excuse my writing again, Grace. So the accuracy, of course, is how close the data is to the true value. So you could actually have a piece of data that's highly precise, but it's completely inaccurate. <laughs> uh, or you could have some data that's accurate, but it's very bad precision. Uh, so you've got those two. And uh, for this one, um, what else? Um, the source of uncertainty in the precision is just random errors. Mm -hmm. Whereas the source of uncertainty, the accuracy, is called systematic errors. Okay. So for example, when we come to the work with the titration, uh, you know, we can try and look and see where the meniscus is. Mm -hmm. And we have to repeat that several times. So that's all an example of trying to get a precise measurement. Yep. So because you know this language, that to get a precise measurement, you need to do repeat results to remove random uncertainty is all a very nice kind of um, vocabulary that you can use when you're writing your narrative. Um, and when it comes to the standard solution uh, later on, that's all about having something that's very, very accurate. Yeah. So you're starting to use the language of uh, having a uh, work that's accurate and having uh, ways of removing systematic errors. Okay. So for these random errors, the way you reduce them, or the random uncertainty, is through repeats. And that's what you're doing when you're doing the titration. So for trying to minimize these systematic errors, 
you're just trying to use the best possible equipment that you've got. Mm -hmm. And that's why you start to get into using, say, a volumetric flask rather than a measuring cylinder. They both measure volumes, but one will give you a more accurate measurement than the other. So this one over here is all about uh, apparatus. <laughs> and the, the design of your experiment. So you could, you know, we, we, I, I don't think this really comes up in this particular uh, question, mm -hmm. um, but it may come up in other exam questions. They might say, well, why are you using a volumetric flask rather than um, a measuring cylinder? Well, the volumetric flask is a more accurate piece of apparatus. It minimizes systematic errors, and so you can have more accurate value because you're working the vocabulary on the right-hand side. And then when you're talking about the repeat measurements that you do with the titration, you're talking about removing random errors so the precision is greater. Um, and you're talking about the vocabulary on the left-hand side. So you're kind of setting yourself self up here to use the right vocabulary in the right contexts. Uh, the other thing we should just check as well is, um, a little bit about uh, the, the way you express quantitatively the uncertainty. Okay? okay. So you've got a, a, some uncertainty, and we've got to express that not is it more or less accurate, or is it more or less precise. You, that's uh, qualitative. You've got to try and express it quantitatively. All right? So, uh, typically, uh, if you go in the, in the labs, if you're measuring uh, mass, you'll have a balance which will give you a reading. Let's say you measure the mass of something, it'll give you to two decimal places. It's a typical um, value that you get from a, 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 a measurement from a balance in the lab. Okay. At university, that'll go to four decimal places, but for A level, you usually have two decimal places. Uh, and so you're um, measuring here to 0 0.01 grams, because the next level up would be 23.46. Okay. So the uncertainty that's related to that measurement is half of the final. Um, number at the end there. So the final number is uh, 0 0.01 grams. So if you, if you took a single measurement, then you're plus or minus 0 0.05 is the uncertainty in that measurement. All right. The thing, and again, we're going to use sort of vocabulary here a bit, but so if you just want to measure the mass of something on a balance in the lab, the uncertainty is the measurement that you made and half of the final uh, unit there, mm -hmm. which is 0 0.005. But often, um, you're not just making a measurement, but you're making a measurement by difference. Mm -hmm. Now, when you did the titration, you had a starting value and a finishing value. And you subtracted those to get your titles. That, that's a different difference. And it's exactly the same for measuring mass. It's usually much, much better to do a mass, mass measurement by difference. So you take one measurement, yeah. then take another, and then subtract them. So at that point, when you start to uh, subtract, you, let's say you take another mass measurement here, and it's 21 point four five okay you, then you're going to say well, the difference there is going to be uh, two grams of it but because you've got this plus or minus 0 0.05 then actually the um, oh. Oh, wait, okay. yeah. um, you're the uh, the uncertainty there for the difference is 0 0.01. Okay. 
Okay, so you've got uh, your uncertainty for a particular measurement, which is half the final digit, mm -hmm. and you've got your uncertainty for your difference, which is double the uncertainty for one measurement. Yeah, yeah. Okay, got that? <laughs> so that's when, when you're measuring mass. For the burettes, uh, you're, you've got this, you've got a, no. <laughs> These graduations. And when you look at a sorry. Well, so and you can have a, a major graduation and then you have minor graduations. So the major graduations on the Burette are what? Point one. Um, ma major. They're t uh, ten? Five? Wait. So you'd have if you looked at it, you'd have yeah. say twenty-five there. Yeah. And you'd have 26 on there. These, these are centimeters cubed, don't they? So that the major graduations are centimeters cubed, and then you've got 10 minor ticks in between. Exactly. All right. So uh, you'd end up with a figure, you'd measure that. Um, and because the, the ticks there are 0.1 of a centimeter cubed, mm -hmm. the uncertainty in a particular measurement is plus or minus 0 0.05. But because when you're doing the uh, titration, you're doing a difference, it's going to be double that. So the actual, when you do the difference, this is a single, that's a single measurement, and this is a uh, difference measurement. Again, the, the uncertainty is plus or minus. 0 0.1 centimeters cubed. Is that me or you? Hmm? I, I think I hit something. Oh, sorry. Oh, I must have knocked that. Okay. I wish I could write better for you, guys, but so you, 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 what I'm trying to emphasize is you have a, one type of uncertainty for a single measurement. Most of the time you want to do a difference measurement, and so the uncertainty doubles. That's basically um, that's what we're saying here. The only slight difference here is that when you come to burette, even though it's marked every 0.1 of a centimeter cubed, your eyes are good enough to see in between those. So you can actually look at the bottom of that meniscus there. That can draw it very well. Let's try and do another one. It's all badly drawn. So you can actually see in between those. So your measurements here would be 25.45. Centimeters cubed for an individual measurement, yeah. plus or minus 0 0.05, and then for the difference, uh, you're going to have plus or minus 0 0.1. Yeah. Okay. Last bit of vocabulary then is that uh, these uh, uncertainties, either for a single measurement or for a difference measurement, those are absolute uncertainties. Yeah. So it actually says, well, this is really what it is. The uh, uncertainty oh, yes. is 0.1 of a centimeter cube. It's yeah. an absolute number. Uh, sometimes you want to use a percentage uncertainty. Now, so sometimes you'll use the absolute uncertainty, sometimes you use the percentage uncertainty. And the percentage uncertainty is this number here divided by the measurement that you've got, like the volume or the mass. Okay. Okay. And I've seen this question uh, once in a, a practical paper, and they, uh, a student had to weigh out a particular mass, and they said, well, you could weigh out this chemical, or you could weigh out this chemical, which one do you want to use? Mm -hmm. Um, you could use both, it doesn't really matter because when you dissolve them up, it has the same uh, iron in there. They yeah. were just slightly different ionic compounds. One was a useful iron that they were never going to use, the other one was a spectator iron. Mm -hmm. uh, they think, well, you know, which of these ionic compounds are you going to use? Uh, probably like a sodium salt and a potassium salt. Yeah. And the molar mass of the sodium salt is smaller than the molar mass of the potassium salt because potassium has a greater relative atomic mass than sodium. Mm -hmm. With me? Yeah. And so what happens is when you get to the percentage uncertainty, 
to weigh out the same number of moles of sodium salt as potassium mm. salt, you weigh out a greater mass mm. of the potassium salt. And so the mass of what you're weighing out changes. The potassium salt has a greater mass, the sodium salt has a smaller mass, but the balance, uncertainty, doesn't change. Mm -hmm. It's still uh, 0.005. So that means that you have a much, much smaller percentage uncertainty when you weigh out the more massive amount of the potassium salt yeah. than you weigh out when the smaller mass of the sodium salt. Yeah. So as a rule of thumb, you, if you have a choice or there's a question in the paper, you're weighing out or you're measuring out the more massive or the larger one mm -hmm. because you can change the volume or, or the mass, mm -hmm. but you can't change the uncertainty that the burette or the... Uh, weighing balance gives you, that's fixed. Mm. And so you end up with a smaller percentage uncertainty when you've got a larger mass. It's a kind of subtle point, um, but I, I haven't seen that in a CIE paper, but I've seen that in, in another paper. Okay. Um, so that, that's all kind of background to this. It's not specific to this particular paper, but it's all, it's, it's all implicit and it may come up in other papers that have a similar kind of theme. Um, so, Shall I go to the... Okay, so, just, so we've got uh, a language there. We, yeah. You've definitely got these two branches of language, one about precision, one about accuracy, and you need to be uh, clear about, uh, well, we're repeating these uh, titrations to get better precision. And we're doing uh, some other measurement, like we're using a different type of apparatus because it improves our accuracy. Yeah. So you, you, you're all set up uh, for the vocabulary that you're going to use. Good. All right. Let's uh, uh, go to the paper then. Just scan back to the top. Oh, uh, so here we go. So yes. um, the first question is almost like a structured question, like we had in paper, paper four, was it yesterday? Um, and you could just uh, look up uh, Le Chatelier's principle and use it uh, in, in this example. And uh, when the temperature is increased, then the position of equilibrium shifts shifts to the left. You get more reactant and less product. All right. So and you, you you've got that in your your answers, no doubt. And so when you come to the graph here, they're just asking you to show that uh, as the temperature increases along here you're expecting the solubility, which is up here, to decrease. So you're getting some kind of relationship that shows temperature increasing, solubility, sorry, temperature increasing, solubility decreasing. Yes. All right. And because they've given you one value, it was, was it uh, five, five, and five grams per decimeter cubed at 25 five. degrees, you've definitely got to get that point in. And they've asked you to draw the range from zero to 100. So at that point, I would be, with my ruler, just sketching out here. That's 10 degrees, 20 degrees, that's, that's probably what you did, 30 degrees and so on. And then up here, you know that that's five, and then you've got some other things here. Now we don't know whether it's a linear relationship or a, a more complex relationship. So it's absolutely fine just to draw a straight line that has a decreasing slope. Uh, when I came to it, uh, I drew a, no, I'm not going to. I should be going through that. I just can't use this stylus. So that Don't worry. You know what I mean. So I've got something. It should be a smooth line. <laughs> <laughs> and then that, that comes all the way up to uh, 100 degrees. Yeah? yeah. So they're just making sure you've got that. Um, and then uh, for graphs, you should be labeling up the axes. So on this axis, you've got uh, temperature, and then you do slash degrees Celsius. And up here, you've got solubility and slash grams per decimeter cube. Okay, um, and that, that's just you're taking the quantity and dividing it by the unit, and so these numbers here end up with a essentially because you're just plotting numbers on the graph, they're dimensionless or unitless numbers because you divide it up here. Yes, 
The only other thing is that I would normally get my students to give a title to the graph. Okay. Um, so uh, that would be um, variation of solubility against temperature. And you always, in the title, you always describe the dependent variable against the independent variable. Independent variable is the one that you can change, you're free to change. The dependent one is the one that changes because you've made a change. And so you just, the title is always uh, dependent against independent. I mean, they're not, they're not giving you marks for that. No. In, 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 but I'm, I'm just sort of extending things here because you have the mark scheme. All right. And then they, they ask okay. you about the independent, the dependent variable. You've got that. The independent one is the one that you can change. It's free to change. The dependent one is the one that you measure. Okay, so this is the sort of the 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 sort of meat of the uh, of what we want to talk about here, isn't it? So um, you've got a planning experiment to determine as accurately as possible the concentration of a aqueous solution of chlorine by titration, and there's a big prompt there that you've got to remember that this uh, solubility of chlorine at 25 degrees, uh, which is approximately well. Room temperature is about 18 or 19 degrees, so this is slightly higher than room temperature. They give you some hazards, they'll pick that those up later on. Um, and they're telling you here that the way they're going to do this uh, titration is in two steps. Um, rather, than, rather than measure the amount of chlorine directly, you're going to measure it indirectly. Mm -hmm. So you convert the chlor chlorine to iodine, and then later on you're going to measure the amount of iodine. Mm -hmm. okay? So that it, it's kind of an indirect uh, titration. This is a displacement reaction, and you're going to be adding excess potassium iodide to make sure that all of the chlorine has been converted to yeah. iodine. All right. And when iodine is in water, well, this is where some students kind of get, it, it's an interesting one. So um, iodine is a solid. I don't know if you did your pre level studies, did you ever see iodine? Uh, as in with my eyes? Yeah, <laughs> have you ever seen it? Or? Uh, I don't know. Okay, all right. So uh, when you look at iodine, it is, the solid is grey crystals, mm -hmm. okay. and iodine is kind of sort of famous because it sublimes, which means yeah. it goes directly from solid to gas, and uh, the gas, iodine gas, is purple. All right, and if you dissolve iodine in some solvents, then the solution looks purple. But when you dissolve iodine in water, it doesn't look grey, <laughs> it doesn't look purple, but it looks brown. And that's where you know, a lot of people get tripped up because you've got these three colours all mm. applying to iodine. Grey is a solid, purple is a gas, sometimes purple in solution. If it's in water as a solution, then it appears brown. Okay. Or, or if it's very, very diluted, they say it appears straw yeah. coloured. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, chlorine dissolved in water will be colourless. Potassium iodide dissolved in water, it'll be colourless. Potassium chloride dissolved in water, it's colourless. So when you do this conversion, you're going to end up with a solution which is going to be brown, pale brown, or if it's really dilute, a straw colour. Okay, so uh, this uh, sodium sulphite here solution is also colourless. So you've got this tricky thing where you've got this solution of iodine which is like pale brown. And when it gets used up, it's colourless. And in the titration, you're, unless you use an indicator, you're trying to see when a pale straw coloured solution goes colourless. It's impossible, it's almost impossible to judge. And so uh, what they do with these titrations for iodine is when you've added so much of 
uh, what's coming from the burette, in this case, uh, sodium sulfide. And the brown color has gone light brown, light brown, light brown, straw, almost gone completely. At the point where it's almost gone completely, you add starch. Okay, and iodine binds to starch, and that goes a really, really deep blue. It's like uh, blue ink or something like that. And so bang, suddenly everything's gone blue, and it's much, much easier to see. And at that point, you just add the remaining sodium thiosulfate, drip by drip, and as soon as the iodine's all gone, that blue color just goes like that, you can't see it anymore. So you're using uh, starch as an indicator, and you just put it in right uh, as the uh, iodine solution is about to fade completely, it's a straw color, and that allows you to determine the endpoint very quickly. Yeah. Okay, I don't know if you did, you probably did an acid-base titration when you did. I have uh, done, yeah. I've done one with starch. Oh, okay, all right, okay, cool, all right, good, so. Uh, and there's the uh, materials that you provided with. So you've got to do a step-by-step -step, uh, description of how you're going to carry out um, that uh, indirect uh, uh, determination of the amount of chlorine in the solution. Okay, so... Uh, do you want me to... Yes, yeah, so let, let's try and get uh, another completely blank page if we can on the right-hand side. So, okay. Um, can I? Ooh. Oh, that, that, this, oh, I can use that. that. Okay, all right, okay. So, um, one of the clues in the question this is going to be our apparatus. There's the burette, very badly drawn, with this tap at the end there. And then you've got a conical flask here. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, all right, good. Okay, so um, what's going in the burette? That's the... So, I don't know what I'm doing. It's sodium thiosulfate solution. Uh, and that has to be a standard solution. Okay? And then in here, We've got the uh, iodine that we're wanting to titrate. All right, uh, where's it going with this? Oh, yeah, okay, so the clue that they give you in the paper is that typically you put into that flask, which is typically a 250 centimeter cubed uh, conical flask, typically you'll put in there exactly. 25 centimeters cubed of the solution that contains the chlorine. All right. And they give you a clue in the paper to say that, well, if you put 25 centimeters cubed in there, you're expecting to run in from here 25 centimeters cubed mm. because the range of that burette goes up to 50 centimeters cubed. So running in 25 centimeters cubed is quite comfortable. So your task is you've got to figure out how to make a standard solution of sodium uh, sulfide so that about 25 centimeters cubed is enough to uh, titrate all the iodine which came from the chlorine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So they gave. You, I mean, they're giving you lots of hints because they reminded you that the concentration of chlorine is going to be about five grams per decimeter cubed. Okay, which is sort of okay, but we, we need it in not a mass per decimeter cube, but an amount, of the number of moles. And so you just had to convert that into an amount per decimeter cube, and that's just a normal uh, conversion from a mass to uh, an amount. So what did you get for the concentration of the chlorine uh, as uh, moles per decimeter cube? Uh, 0. 0.0704. Okay. Multiple yeah, that's good. I thought I was getting good at this last <laughs> time. <laughs> okay, good. All right, so, uh, and so if we put 25 centimeters cubed of 0. 0.0704 moles per decimeter cubed, then we need to run in enough thiosulfide so there's about 25 centimeters cubed of sodium thiosulfide. Mm -hmm. 
And if you look back at the stoichiometry of the equations, uh, you've got a stoichiometry of uh, one mole of the chlorine is giving you one mole of the iodine. Yeah. Uh, and then the number of moles of sodium thiosulfite you needed was? Two, two. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. Okay. So if this standard solution of sodium thiosulfate was the same concentration, then we'd be running at about 50 centimeters cubed. Because we need twice as much, don't we? Yeah. And that's no good because you can only fit in 50 centimeters cubed yeah. in here. So to get uh, about 25 centimeters cubed coming from the burette and going into there, that means that the concentration of the standard solution of sodium thiosulfite is going to be not that, but about, what does it need to be roughly? Uh, will it be 0.035? No, because um, to uh, use oh, sorry. all the iodine, you're going to need twice as much yeah. sodium thiosulfide. Point so, one four one. Yeah, you, you're going to need a concentration which is about 0. 0.141 moles per decimeter cubed. Good. All right. So, um, and is, is that where you got stuck? Uh, I got that. Okay. So All I got right. up Good. to there. Right. I got Fantastic. that part. Right. Um, right. so we've got that. So that means that to fill up this burette, you've got to get a volumetric flask. Okay, and that's they're two hundred and fifty centimeters cube. The volumetric flasks, and you've got to put in there. A solution which is going to be round about 0.14 moles per decimeter cube. Yeah. All right. Now, this goes back to the conversation we had earlier because we now need to start using the language of accuracy mm -hmm. because we've particularly chosen to use a volumetric flask rather than a measuring cylinder because you get more accurate. Uh, values from a volumetric flask than you would do if you use a measuring cylinder. So you, you've chosen the equipment to give you higher accuracy. Um, so we know that um, we've got to have 250 centimeters cubed of 0 0.14 moles per decimeter cubed a solution. And when you did your work, did you uh, assume that your volumetric flask was 250 centimeters cubed? Okay, all right, good. Did they say that in the question? Or? No, they didn't. Okay, yeah. all right, okay, so, all right. So, and then they, they tell you that you're using uh, sodium thiosulfate, but actually it's the hydrated salt, so 5H2O. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, if we had to make up a liter, then we put 0 0.141 moles in. Mm -hmm. But you're not making up a litre, you're making up a, a quarter of a litre. So the number of moles that you're going to have in there is not 0 0.141, but 0 0.141 divided by 4. Okay, that's where I... I yeah, dilution. Yeah, does, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, or maybe like that's the way I... I mean, how, how would you say that? Um, no, no, I, th I think you can. Okay, all right, okay. So, so uh, have you got a calculator with you? I do. Okay, right. So, um, we don't want to measure out 0 0.141 models. Mm -hmm. We want to measure out a quarter of that. 0 0.0352. Two, but 0 0.035 is good. And to convert from amount in units of moles, the mass in units of grams, mm -hmm. you do what? We need the MR. Well, okay, just be careful. What is MR? Uh, the, the relative mass, the molecular mass. Yeah, okay. It's, it's the sum, isn't it, of, of the ARs? Yeah. 
which is the relative atomic mass. Yeah. Okay. So just this is me being pedantic. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, if you look up uh, an AR mm -hmm. and on the periodic table in the data book and combine yeah. it to give you an MR, mm -hmm. it's relative. It's unitless. Yeah. There's no units. Yeah. So actually, uh, to convert to a mass. Uh, you're working with something called the molar mass, which is symbol M. Okay. Okay, so that is what you look up from the periodic table, and it's unitless, because it's a relative number. And the molar mass is the same number, but, but in units of grams per mole. Okay, yeah. Right? And when we we've got a value in moles and we're trying to work out a mass in grams, then you need to use the molar mass so the uh, dimensions are correct. Got it. Now again, it, it never yeah. comes up on a paper, but yes. we're just being <laughs> sort of, yeah. we're just being tight about what we're talking about. Maybe. So you're right. So you've got uh, the amount in moles and you've got the molar mass in grams per mole because mm -hmm. uh, they gave it to you and added it all up. And what was the molar mass of sodium thiosulfate 5H2O? Uh, the 248.2. Two. <laughs> Why are we going to YouTube? Oh, <laughs> no, I did. <laughs> you want me to delete it? Give me a second. There's <laughs> some uh, copy and paste. Oh, I don't know if I can. Oh, no, it must be like a right mouse click or something. Yes. So we've got the danger that we're going to start playing a YouTube video. Oh, great. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I don't okay. know. All right, never mind. Okay, so. Wait, I'll get you the pen again. Oh, okay. Oh, no, we go for that. Okay, all right. So the molar mass of sodium thiosulfide, 5H2O, was, you said, 200 and 248.2. Okay, and because it's a molar mass, so more. Okay. So <clears throat> we needed to measure out uh, about 0.35 of a mole. Uh, so what mass do we need to measure it approximately? Um, Did you that, that times that? No, because yeah. I hadn't done Okay, that can you just, sorry, can you just quickly punch the numbers in the no camera? Problem. then? Yeah. So, 8.687. Okay. So now we've got to measure our mass of a mass of 8. Point, did you say 8? Eight eight, uh, 687. 687 grams. Okay. That's, that's a mass in grams. I can't seem to get a gram in there. I don't know why. You know what I mean. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So, um, in principle, you've got to measure out a mass of 8.687 grams, dissolve it in water, and get it at a volumetric flask of 250 centimeters cubed. But the uh, accurate way of measuring the mass. It's going to be um, measuring by difference. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you got that in the work that you did. Okay. So what, what you do, this is all kind of weird because we've Wait a second. Of, Wait a second. Uh, oh, go to a page. Okay, good. All right. So if we're in a laboratory, then it's much easier to show you. But <laughs> let's say you've got um, a balance in a laboratory and the balance in there is going to say something like 23.45 because that it gives you to two decimal places. Mm -hmm. right so what you'll do, you're going to put on there, they're called, uh, I don't know if you've used this before, they're called weighing boats. And they're little plastic dishes mm -hmm. uh, for measuring uh, chemicals. Out. Right. Or yeah. you could use um, yeah, uh, weighing boats. So what you're going to do is you're going to put in there about 
you're going to put in there 8.687 grams. And then you're going to take that and you've got a beaker over here and you're going to tip all that solid in there. It's just in there. And because you're measuring by difference, you're then going to come back here and you're going to measure the mass again. Yeah. So you might get, um, you come back and you measure the mass and it's 14.36. Okay. And so you, you know accurately how much mass is in there mm -hmm. because uh, you've measured the weighing boat and the solid and then you measure the weighing boat because there might be a few crystals of solid that have got left behind. Do you see what I mean? So, in, so we know accurately uh, what the mass is in there. So uh, just the sake of argument, what, what, what does that difference come to? Um, I can tell you actually. Okay. 9.1, no, 9.1, 9, 9, 9, 9. Correct. Yes. And just because we're talking about it, the uncertainty in a difference measurement is what? It's point 0.1. You mean? Uh, zero 0.1. Yes. Sorry. Okay, so that's your uncertainty. So in, in, the, in this particular question, they don't ask you about uncertainty. Mm -hmm. so we're just talking about it as we go through. Okay. So, um, so, so the language you might use when you're writing this up is to say, mm -hmm. in order to make sure that the there's an accurate measurement of the mass of sodium thiosulfate sulfite, we're going to use a digital balance to do measurement of mass by difference. Okay. Can you see how the vocabulary, yeah. if, if you use the right words, it saves you from writing that whole sentence about measuring different, um, trying to describe it all, because you say I'm measuring mass by difference, and then we know what that is. Okay. All right, so you've got an accurate mass did you have all this in the work that you did? Uh, no, I didn't write it. I've done it before. Like, okay. I've done it in other papers, but okay. normally when they, as I said, with this masking, yeah. they didn't mention anything no. of it. So I was a bit confused in terms yeah. of, do they want us to put it in there or not? Okay, so I, I think the mask scheme is the mark scheme. Yeah. And in fact, I think there was only one mark for making up a volumetric solution. Oh, so, okay. so they can't need all of this. <laughs> but I'm just using the opportunity yeah. to go through it. So yeah. if... Something Some more. papers do, right? oh, okay. or they give you marks for it, and yeah. you get, you could get like sixteen possible. You can only have eight maximum, but there are sixteen di way, different ways you could get those oh, okay. marks. Okay. And by like adding things like this, they'll give you a mark for that. Okay. And said, so, right. so, so, okay, good. So we've got now, uh, we've got a, um, a, a two hundred. <laughs> that's two hundred and fifty centimeter cubed beaker and we've got an accurate mass of sodium thiosulfate yeah. in there. All right. um, and so you then get um, distilled water normally you have a water bottle I don't you use those in the lab oh yeah it's good yeah, it's like a, yeah. a little thing with a tube at the top yeah. okay so you use the distilled water bottle and because you know finally You've got to get to 250 centimeters cubed. You can't get more than 250 centimeters cubed in mm here. -hmm. You don't overshoot. So I might put in there something like 100 centimeters cubed of distilled water. Mm -hmm. All right. And then you get uh, a glass rod and you stir everything and you just make sure that it's dissolved. Okay. All right. um, and then once you once everything is dissolved, you then take your volumetric glass. <laughs> and you put in the top a funnel, okay, so you're not going to drop anything, and then you tip the beaker, and everything that was in the beaker then goes into the bottom of the flask. But because you're trying to be accurate, um, and remember that uh, accurate is all about the procedure that you use. We, we can't do repeat measurements here. It's nothing about precision or random errors. It's about systematic errors and accuracy. So that's why I call that vocabulary at the beginning. And so um, 
We've got really good apparatus, we just have to make sure that we have really, really good technique as well. And so once you've poured in that 100 centimeters cubed, what I would do is then get that squeezy water bottle and rinse out the beaker and pour it through, and then rinse out the beaker and pour it through. So you rinse out the beaker three times to make sure that everything that was dissolved up eventually ended up in solution down here. Yeah. Now, so you've rinsed out the beaker three times, that's fantastic, the beaker's, you know, there's nothing left in there at all, and then you should rinse the glass rod a few times, and then you should rinse the funnel a few times, so there's absolutely nothing left behind. Um, and so after all that rinsing, you've probably filled it up to about there, and you can take the funnel off, but the 250 centimeter cube mark is there. So what you do is you then uh, eyeball it and with your uh, distilled water bottle you can then just add water in until the bottom of the meniscus comes up. Uh, so the bottom of the meniscus is against the 250 centimeter cube. In fact, uh, some people are even, instead of using the distilled water bottle, some people get a pipette and just sort of add drop by drop right at the end until it's exactly at 250 centimeters cubed. And the um, trick is to make sure that your eye level with the bottom of the meniscus at 250 centimeters cubed. And you get systematic errors if you're looking down at it or you're looking up at it. Okay. Okay? So sometimes if, if this was the bench in the laboratory, you see him just kind of crouching down and looking at things horizontally so that um, you, you're getting, uh, and again, this is an accurate measurement um, because you don't want to introduce inaccuracies or systematic errors. And then, <clears throat> and then once you've done all of that and you've taken the um, uh, 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 funnel out and you've filled it up to exactly 250 centimeters cubed, your last job with this, almost last job, with this solution is you put a stopper in <laughs> because if you leave it on the bench on a hot day then you could come back to it an hour's time and some of the water has evaporated and that's made the solution more concentrated than you were expecting so putting a stopper in is always a good idea okay now so we, we've done a really great job about making this standard solution because we've done all this very careful measurement of mass by difference we've done all this very accurate work uh, we've rinsed everything, but we don't actually know yet, even though it's a standard solution, what its concentration is. So you have to say, well, I got uh, 9.09 grams, and I made it up exactly to 250 centimeters cubed, so the concentration is, and then you just do that quickly in the calculator. Yep. Uh, what two? So your volumetric flask is 250 centimeters cubed. Your mass is that, and you know your molar mass over here, don't you? It's 200. And, what's it? 240. 40A. Yeah. So can you work out a concentration then yeah. for that standard solution? So, 1.46 times 10 to the minus 4. Okay. It's really, really small. Yes. Well, well that's well spotted. Oh, because I I what, did, what did you do? I haven't converted it to decimal cubed. The volume, uh, the, the 250. Yes, because you've got 250 centimeters cubed and yeah. you, need to, you need this uh, concentration in, to, uh, in decimeter, moles per decimeter cubed. But that's so good because you caught yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So the concentration was? 0 0.0146. Okay. So your concentration is 0 0.0146 mm -hmm. moles per decimeter cubed. Now, the thing is that um, like you got 
0.146 moles per decimeter mm -hmm. cube because you weighed by difference 9.09. Mm -hmm. Now, I might be doing this mm -hmm. and I might have 8.95. So we'll all end up with a different concentration, but the con you know, whoever, whether it's mine or yours, is accurate. And that's the yeah. point, is that we're not trying to make up a particular concentration, mm -hmm. we're trying to make up an accurate concentration. Okay. And it has to be roughly in the right order, because we said somewhere over here, didn't we, that we needed a concentration of about 0 0.141. And you've ended up with 0 0.0146, and that's fine. Because when it, you, you're slightly higher or low, do you think? Slightly higher here. Yeah. Okay, so when you run in from the burette, are you expecting your title to be more or less than 25 centimeters cubed? Um, less? Yes. Yeah. Because you calculated 25, 25. Yeah. And your standard solution is slightly more concentrated than you would like, ideally. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. we expect the tighter to be maybe 23 centimeters cubed, something like that. Okay. It's still absolutely fine because we shouldn't be trying to make up exactly 0 0.141. Mm -hmm. We should be weighing by deference and coming up with, with something which is close to that. And it doesn't really matter what the number is as long as the number is accurate. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so we've got our standard solution, and typically people write or stick, they write with a like a sharpie or something on the flask what the concentration is, um, so that um, you know we know that is sodium thiosulfite at this particular concentration, and it's ready to go. You put the stopper in it; it's not going to change its concentration. Because nothing's going to evaporate. Good. All right, so. Um, Okay, so you then got your burette, and what happens is that these uh, burettes typically get washed. It's like a big washing machine in the lab. I mean, you know, anyway, they put them in like a, like a big dishwasher, and so these things come out of the dishwasher, and a bit like if you have a dishwasher at home, you might get a bit of water left in the mug or the teapot or something like that. And typically, there's a bit of water that's kind of left in, in the tap because it's, it's, it's got a little mechanism, so it's very easy for water to get stuck in there. So what you should do with a burette before you use it is you should just take some of your standard solution and wash the burette a bit. Uh, so you kind of wash the burette, and then you just put a little bit of liquid in there, open the tap, and run it through, and that makes sure that if there's any water that's left over there from the dishwasher, that it's been flushed away. So you're preparing your burette. Okay? And once you've prepared your burette, you can fill it up uh, with your sodium thiosulfite solution. And we know very accurately what the concentration of that is, which in your case is 1.46 moles per decimeter cube, because you do that calculation. Yeah? yeah? All right, good. All right, so uh, that's all set up, and you must make sure that the level there is at zero or more. Because if it's above zero, the, 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 the scale stops, you can't measure it. Right. And again, I've drawn that as a, a line, but you're looking at the bottom of the meniscus and you're looking at it sort of horizontally as well. Okay, so that's the thirdium thiosulfite solution set up. And then you've got your flask down here, haven't you? Okay, and what's going on there? You've got uh, exactly 25 centimeters cubed of the chlorine solution. Yeah. Right. How does that get in there? Well, you're going to use something called a pipette. Mm. Very badly drawn. <laughs> because. Uh, okay, and again, you're not using, using a measuring cylinder because you're trying to be accurate. So we very carefully select our equipment and our procedure to make sure that we're accurate. We can't, um, you come to re reproducing things later on and removing random error. If we're trying to work with accuracy at this point. And so uh, with the uh, pipette, it's got a little mark up there, which is for 25 centimeters cubed. 
and you're going to have it, it's called a, a, a bowl it's like a kind of squeezy thing on top of the users before and you can it has a little couple of valves on it you squeeze it and the water or the solution comes up and then you can uh, make the valve open or close until as you're eye eyeballing it you can see uh, that's meant to be horizontal uh, that it, you've got the bottom of meniscus exactly there yeah and then you're going to uh, take the uh, or release one of the valves here and drain it into there and what you should do is just touch the side of the flask at the end so that the last drop comes out of the pipette i don't know if you did that with you uh, uh... Well, we try to make sure that everything's okay. Done, but oh. I can't. Okay, so what happens is you, you touch the side of the flask and the last drop comes out, and you end up with uh, like a tiny bit that's just left in there. Yeah. And this thing is calibrated to yeah. know that you're going to end up with a tiny drop in there. So don't try and blow it out or anything <laughs> like that because you're starting to get uh, something that's not accurate. Okay, so you've got exactly 25 centimeters cubed of this chlorine solution. And we don't know the concentration of that. We're trying to find it out. That's the whole point of this. But we can't measure chlorine directly. We've got to measure it indirectly by converting it all to iodine. And at that point, you add in excess potassium iodide. Now, it doesn't tell us in the procedure what the concentration of potassium iodide is. So you've just got to say, I'm using excess to make sure that all the chlorine is converted to iodine. And at the end of that, we should end up with uh, a pale brown solution in here. It started off its life as 25 centimeters cubed uh, of an unknown concentration of chlorine. It's now a bit more than 25 centimeters cubed because we added some uh, potassium iodide, and all the chlorine has been converted into iodine, and it's a pale brown solution. Okay, so um, the first thing you do is, uh, you're all set up now, you're ready to go. That's, it's a lot of work just to get to the starting point. And we know it's gonna be hmm, about 25 centimeters cubed, probably a bit less because you end up with a slightly more concentrated solution of sodium thiosulfide than you would have liked. So just run some, um, you do your first titer. So you're gonna have some kind of table here And you've got rows and columns. And so you're going to have a, a starting volume and an ending volume. And that should be slash centimeters cubed, slash centimeters cubed. Yes. Uh, and these are volumes or titers. And so for the first one, let's say you're starting at 0, 0.0 and you run it through and all the brown color almost disappears. You add in the ID, it goes blue, you add drop by drop, and then the ID disappears, bang, you've got uh, your titration. And let's say that ends up in your case at 23.05. Okay, so your titer on that occasion is 23.05. Now, almost certainly, because this was a trial run, it's your first run through, probably that's not quite accurate. So. The first run is usually like a dry run. It's, it's not dry. It's, it's a test run to see, well, I need to know that I need to slow down and be very, very careful when I get to about 22 centimeters cubed, something like that. So this is going to be our first real run, and we're going to add lots and lots of thiosulfite in until we get to about 22, and then make sure the iodine's in there so we can see a dark blue color, and then we're adding drop by drop, and uh, shaking the flask mm -hmm. until with one drop the color changes from blue to colorless. Okay, and if you add a drop by drop, you'll get another tighter here. Let's say that's actually 22.90. Okay, now it's not good enough just to know that you're um, kind of you've been careful on this occasion, you need to keep going until you get two results that are within. Point one of each other. 
Okay, so those, and but the word for that is you just keep going and going and going. You might take it three or four times to get it, achieving it there, um, <laughs> until you get two results that are within 0 0.1 centimeter cubed of each other. Yeah. Uh, because we know from earlier on, when we looked at this as a measurement by difference, yeah. and actually the uncertainty in a measurement is actually 0.1. If you remember, we looked at that earlier on. So this is as good as it's going to get because we can't get any better because that's the level of uncertainty. So that's where that point one comes from. Uh, so you keep going, and let's say you've got something like um, if the next run was uh, right here, 22.6, well, I'm, I still don't have two concordant results. Mm -hmm. So if the next run was 22.6, I'm sorry. Uh, That's okay. Is, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't, I, I, maybe I can't write in that. I don't gap think there. you can. Okay, 22 and 7. So that's not concordant, but the results, yeah. if you like, if, that, if a dry run was result was tighter 1, that was tighter 2, tighter 3, and tighter 4 are concordant. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at that point you're saying, good to go. I've got concordant results. And what you should do, if you've got your table set up like this, you'll have a start and end. And then you'll have a row for tighter. Let's look at row there. And so we'd have uh, 23.05, 22.9, 26.01, uh, you know, whatever the next concordant one is. And then you should have another row at the bottom down here. I don't know if you did this when you did your titrations before. And you should, and we've got a fourth column there as well, haven't we? Because we had to go to the fourth column before we had uh, concordant results. You should take that and take that to show by those ticks that those are the concordant results. Okay. So that they may ask you to lay out a table or something mm -hmm. like this. So you've got columns for your titers, one, two, three, four. You've got start, end. You subtract them, you get a the difference, you work out the titer. Then a final row with tick, tick to show those are the ones that I'm going to use for my concordant results. And then you just take an average of those. Uh, so in our case, I can't, my writing's so bad that I can't see because that, tw that was 26.0 and 22.7 and 22.6. All right. So the average of those is going to be 22.65, isn't it? Yeah. And if we had to express the uncertainty, it's plus or minus 0 0.1 centimeters cubed. Okay, they don't express, they don't ask us to express the uncertainty there. Okay, so we've now got our titers. And we, we, we know that 22.65 centimeters cubed of uh, the standard solution is enough to react with all the chlorine that's in there. All right. So you now have to do a, a calculation to say, well, if I'm using 22.65 centimeters cubed of sodium thiosulfate, and we know the concentration of that because you worked it out earlier for me it was 1.46, was it? Moles per decimeter cube? Yeah, yes. Is that correct? Yeah, that's okay. what we got. All right, so we've got that value there, and we have confidence on that because we did the concordant measurements and we took an average. And we have confidence in this as well because we worked very hard making our polymetric solution accurately. We should have uh, confidence then I'm going to write N, which is the symbol for amount. The amount of, well, what are we measuring here? It's the amount of sodium thiosulfate, isn't it? What's the, you know, we, we've run in something for the burette. We know its volume, we know its concentration, we should be able to work out its amount. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to relate amount, concentration, and volume, mm -hmm. concentration is amount divided by volume. Yeah. So to get amount, we've got to do amount is equal to concentration times volume. Mm -hmm. And we just have to make sure that we are correctly changing between centimeters cubed and decimeters cubed because we want um, the concentration is in moles per decimeters cubed and the volume is in centimeters cubed. So we just have to make sure we are correctly uh, changing between those. So you should end up with an amount, and if you were to punch the numbers on the calculator there, you had a concentration of 0.146 moles per decimeter cube. You had a volume of 22.65. Well, 
or to your mount? Um, that times that. Yeah, do you want to do that? Yes. Sir. And just make sure you put your thousand in there as well. So I'm looking for the amount of sodium trisulfide. It should be 3.3 times 10 to the minus 3. Okay, have you got this? Because we don't want to lose... 3.3, uh, uh, 1. Round up. Okay. You should round up at the end, really, rather than rounding up now. So. Okay, 3.306. Um, yeah, okay, do that. So that's 3.306. You've got scientific notation or... Uh, is 10 to the minus 3, I think you said? Yeah. And that, because it's an amount, is a unit of mole. Yes? Mm -hmm. So that's the amount of sodium thiosulfide. Yeah. Now look back at the stoichiometry, somewhere up here, I think. I had double. Yeah. Well, be careful. If you've got an amount of sodium thiosulfide, mm -hmm. then the amount of iodine or the amount of chlorine is what relative to the amount of sodium thiosulfide? Oh. Yes. So earlier on we had to multiply up by two, now we're having to multiply, we're having to divide by two to get back. So if you've got uh, what is it, an amount of sodium thiosulfide, which is that, your amount of iodine, which equals the amount of chlorine, is the number that you had divided by two, which is? Which is 1.65 times 10 to the minus. Okay, keep going. I don't want to lose. Uh, uh, 1.653. Okay. Times 10 to the minus 3 moles, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, all right. Now, remember, that's the number of moles of chlorine, mm -hmm. and you used the pet very carefully earlier on to have an accurate volume for the chlorine solution as well. So, you've now got uh, the number of moles of chlorine, you've got the volume of chlorine, you've got to work out a concentration of chlorine, yeah. okay? And concentration, of course, is just the number of moles, the amount, divided by the volume, being careful to use a conversion factor from decimeters cubed and centimeters cubed. Well, you know the number of moles of chlorine, you've got it from over here, it's uh, I've lost it. 1.653 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. You know your volume of chlorine, you measured that out very carefully earlier on, is 25 centimetres cubed. So your concentration, just punch the numbers into the calculator, is? Yes. Make sure you're using the 1,000 yeah. conversion. Uh, what? My your, constant, your number of moles is over there, mm -hmm. 1.65 times 10 to the minus 3. Your volume that you used was 25 centimetres cubed. So your concentration is? My concentration is 0 0.0661. It's, and if you use the correct uh, uh, thousand in there as well. Yep. Okay, so you had zero point zero six six one, and that's expressed in moles per decimeter cubed. Yes. Mm -hmm. But if you remember right at the start of the question, they were talking about chlorine concentration in terms of grams per cent per decimeter cubed. Yeah. So your very very last step, you now know its concentration. It's in the wrong units. Yeah. So you've got to convert from a concentration of point zero six six one moles per decimeter. To um, uh, grams per decimeter cube. So you've got to use the molar mass again of chlorine, Cl2. Yeah. So times 35.5 times 2, right? I have to double that. Well, you didn't multiply by 2. Cl2? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, just, I didn't know if you're doing the stoichiometry. Oh. No, it's good. Yeah, 35.5 times 2. So, mm -hmm. um, so we've got 4.695. So you've got a four point six, six nine five okay. grams per decimeter cube. Now, 
you, you, at the end, you, you should be quoting that number to the correct number of significant figures. Mm -hmm. And the number of significant figures should be the smallest number of significant figures that you had in, uh, elsewhere in the calculations. Okay. So you have to look back uh, and see where you have the smallest number of significant figures, because how many significant figures have you got here? Oh. Yes. So, um, I mean, actually, for, because we've been working it through qualitatively, mm -hmm. but you're just writing down a narrative, aren't you? It's not necessary to, to because, I mean, we work numbers out here. But um, you, you'd have to look back and see the smallest number of significant figures. Let's say it was three significant figures from the measurements that we made. Then you'd have to change this to three significant figures as well, okay. just to be consistent. And as a sanity check, you know, we they, they said earlier on that the concentration of chlorine is about five grams per decimeter cube. We've worked it all out. It works out about five grams per decimeter cube. So there's a sanity check at the end there as well. So what I've tried to do, and I've run out of time now, Chris, is I've tried to talk through. Um, practically what you would do. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't actually been through the mark scheme and hit the bullet points, mm -hmm. but you should be able now be able to write this out uh, against the mark scheme and get all the bullet points. And I've tried to cover as well the kind of things that come up in exams, even though in this particular question they didn't specifically come up. And the other thing that I wanted to try and do with you as well is work on all this uh, vocabulary as well, the difference between precision and accuracy, mm -hmm. and that precision is affected by uh, random errors, and you tackle that with repeat measurements. And I wanted you to work on the vocabulary of accuracy, how close something is to the true value, and you tackle that through reducing systematic errors by using careful choice of equipment mm -hmm. uh, and your experimental procedure. And that's why we ended up with all this washing and flushing things out and using <laughs> you know, all that stuff because we were trying to have a good experimental procedure to give us a good accuracy in our standard solution. Good. We're out of time, Tom, so... Yeah, of course. I, 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 you don't have to carry on past it, even if you don't finish everything, it's okay. fine, so I um, appreciate that. I'll stop this. I was actually trying to do a wrap-up. <laughs> oh, okay. Wrap -up, but <laughs> right. Which I meant to as well, actually. I think it's good on the radio show to do that. Yeah. Well, as I said, we're up.